It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 342 of Science on Top. Today is Monday the 30th of September 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hi. This show is only possible thanks to the generous support from our Patreon subscribers, people like Cameron Webb and Mick Vag, who have been chipping in each episode to help us pay the bills and keep the lights on. Just head to scienceontop.com slash donate. But let's begin with Tabby's star. Now, we've talked about this a fair bit on the show. A star 1,500 light years away that varies in brightness, apparently randomly and sometimes quite significantly. There have been loads of hypotheses posited to explain it. Everything from swarms of planets and comets to an alien Dyson sphere constructed to harness the star's energy. But Lucas, what's the latest intriguing theory? Okay, so sh- sh- maybe I'll just do a quick recap so people haven't got to go back and listen to the other episode, um, if that's okay. Is that all right? It, it is. Just- I mean, I thought I just did a quick recap, but hey, do another quick recap. Oh, no, it's, it's, pertinent, do a slower, to, it's pertinent to the new, the new um, uh, theories, basically, okay. the new, new hypotheses. So, so Tabby Star or Borgian Star, or if you prefer Kick 8, Four six two eight five two, whichever your favourite name is. Um, this star was was originally um, noticed by Kepler. If you and if you remember the Kepler mission, the Kepler mission is a planet finder or was a planet finder mission that was pretty much just staring at one swathe of sky, one little patch of sky, looking for changes in brightness. And the reason it was looking for changes in brightness is because, as you may remember. Um, there's a, a, a an effect that's known as the or a method that's known as the transit method of finding planets, whereby as through a chance alignment, uh, a a planet orbits its star and happens to cross the face of its star from our perspective, it will cause a dimming of that star's light. So that's the transit method, and that's what Kepler was designed to look for. Now, Kepler found heaps and heaps, you know, thousands and thousands of stars, uh, of, of, of uh, candidate planets, I should say. So that's that's happened in the past now, but a uh, really cool mission. But this was a very interesting outcome from it because this particular star that was originally noticed around 2009, they found, you know, this star that had a really long transit. Um, it, it had a dip in brightness for a long period of time. And, th- and that was very strange and it was notable. But then it also dimmed. In 2011, it dimmed uh, the, the starlight dimmed by about 15%, which is just huge. I mean, it's mm-hmm. massive. So if you think of a, a a large gas giant, like larger than Jupiter, you would expect to see, given its uh, you know average distance from its star and so forth, you'd expect to see a a planet of that sort of mass would dim its star by perhaps around one percent of its overall light output. And this is 15 times that. Yeah, that's that's huge. I mean, that, that's that's remarkable. Um, and of course, you know that that caused a little bit of uh, um, oh, what the. Uh, <laughs> and then um, there was another event in 2013, which is when everything just went crazy because the citizen science team um, that were analysing Planet Hunter data they noticed that there were just all sorts of dips in the brightness, which lasted days. Um, reductions in brightness over 20%. It was all over the shop. It was just crazy. So that that's why this was notable because it's it's completely unprecedented. We 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 you know we were really stretching for ways of, of of understanding what could be going on here. Now, one thing that science often benefits from is time. Time for people to do certain things and and look into you know potential explanations for 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 why we see what we see. And in the in the in the time since that um, you know the, the media frenzy and the whole talking about Dyson spheres and all that sort of stuff, um, Tabby uh, Boyajian actually did some follow-up research of her own, which showed that the dimming um, that they were seeing uh, was was uh, that was most prevalent in in the case of Tabby Star would would 
uh, it, it tended to be to specific frequencies of light. So we've discussed also on the show in the past dust clouds between us and distant objects. Um, those dust clouds tend to absorb certain frequencies of light and let other frequencies through just by virtue of the size of the particles themselves because the blue light is in very narrow frequencies, the red light's in very wide frequencies and so forth. So because of that effect, which is actually the same thing that leads to the, uh, I think it's called the Rayleigh effect, the Rayleigh effect, which causes our sky to look blue. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's partly because of the way that the, the particles in the air interact with the light as it comes through because they absorb certain frequencies and readmit and other ones just pass straight through. So that's what she found in some follow-up research. Now, a new team, and this is what's actually new here, a new team who are led by uh, Brian Metzger at Columbia University, they've proposed a new explanation, and this basically involves a captured moon. Um, The scenario here requires a series of events to take place. So it's by all, by no means is the answer for sure, but it does explain what we're seeing just with science that we understand, which is great because if you have to invoke new stuff like Dyson spheres, then you know, you're stepping outside of the norm and therefore it requires what's what's the Carl Sagan quote? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. That's it. And I think um I think Tabby herself actually uh referred to that in her TED talk uh about this when she rebuffed you know, claims that it was, um, uh, well, it was clear evidence of a Dyson sphere. By the way, the Dyson sphere thing, that happened to come out of a, there was another, um, there was some other research that took place at roughly the same time as the, as, as, um, as Tabby's paper was, was released back then, which talked about what you would expect to see if mm. an alien um, civilization were building a Dyson sphere around a star. And it just so happened that it was very similar to what we were seeing, mm-hmm. you know, happening with Tabby Star. So that's kind of why the link was drawn there. And, of course, the media, they Lept love aliens. It. So leapt on it. Uh, so anyway, so so what, what have they proposed? So first of all, they did a whole lot of uh, computer simulations looking at what would happen if a planet, for example, a gas giant, which we know tend to form – in the outer regions, you know, of a star system, you know, so we look at our own star system, we've got rocky planets in the middle, we've got the gas giants, you know, sort of out towards the edge, and then we've got the ice giants further out. Now, well, if they don't gas form giants, in the outer regions, they migrate there sometimes. Yes, yes. And, and that's, uh, you know, there's been a lot of stuff uh, that's done about that, trying to tr- figure out what, what where these planets would form and where they could end up based on different series of events. However, we do uh, we ha- we have seen quite often that gas giants can form uh, and often do form in the outer uh, uh, you know rim of this of their system. So that being the case, we also know that our gas giants and our ice giants, most of them have a whole lot of icy moons as a part of you know as a part of their own systems. So if a gas giant happen to have its orbit perturbed by another planet in the system, which can happen, and it does happen. Mm-hmm. In fact, all of the planets in any system actually impact on each other. They all exert a little bit of influence on each other. Um, and if that influence uh, has the, a multiplying effect, so if you think of you know things going around their star millions of times, Tens mm-hmm. of thousands of times, millions of times, whatever. The the number of times that they go around, if, even if they have just a tiny, teeny, teeny effect on each other, that can be enough if it multiplies over time um, to become a significant effect. Sure. So what could have happened is a gas giant, for example, may have been perturbed in its orbit through interactions with other planets in the system. And by the way, we don't know if there's other planets in the, in the system around this particular star, but we do know there's a there red any. giant. Oh, sorry, we do know there's a, a not a red giant. We do know there's a red dwarf pretty close. It may be in a binary system with Tabby Star. We don't know for sure. We have right. to wait for some more um, observations about that over time, just to sort of dial in on on mm-hmm. on what they're doing in relation to each other. But there there is a red dwarf nearby, so it could be that, or there might be another unseen planet, which is quite quite possible, depending on on how long the 
uh, you know, the orbits are and things further out or orbit much, much lower. So um, if these things impacted on the orbit of a gas giant, the gas giant could either, if it was an extreme situation, be completely knocked out of its orbit and be sent careening into the star, or far more likely, it could have its orbit stretched and over time become more and more elliptical. And as it becomes more and more elliptical, it becomes less and less stable. And you, you have an effect similar to comets where you can end up with a planet doing this, this elliptical orbit where it gets very, very close to the star at, you know, at one particular part of its orbit and very far out at another part of its orbit. And if that happened, if it did get too close to the star, then the inevitable would actually happen. It would be pulled off its orbit by the star and the star would basically pull the, the planet into itself. The planet at this point would probably be doomed. It would be sucked into the star, become a part of the star, effectively. Mm -hmm. But as it approaches the star, and this is where the computer simulations come in, as it approaches the star, the team actually found that the vast majority of the moons would share a similar fate, the moons around these gas giants. And as we know, we look at Jupiter, we look at Saturn, there's lots of moons, right? Lots of moons. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> there's likely to be multiple moons. Most of the moons would share a similar fate that end up, going to the star. Some of them would be flung out into the outer reaches of the system or maybe even flung completely out of the system because that happens. But about 10% of the time in their simulations, these moons ended up in orbit around the star, a new orbit of their own. They effectively became planets. You know, planetoids themselves. Oh. Yes. So if these – there's lots of ifs. You can tell <laughs> this is layers and layers of ifs, right? So if this happened and – the moons, moon or moons that ended up in orbit around Tabby Star were ice moons, as tends to be the case we've seen um, in at least our system, because we've not seen moons elsewhere. We haven't actually discovered any exo moons. Um, so so we, we, we've only got the sample size of, of, of what's, in our, what's in our system. Well, there's a lot of moons in our system. Um, if this happened, then these icy moons would quite feasibly cross what's known as the ice line. The ice line? The ice line. Who knew that was a thing? <laughs> I didn't know prior to this particular story that there was an ice line. So what is the ice line? I hear you are. The ice line is the point at which um, a something like a, an icy body, like a comet or a, a moon or whatever, is able to quite happily maintain its volatiles without them being evaporated off. Um, so it's not the same as the habitable zone. Because the habitable zone, which tends to refer to that nice cushy zone in which um, a planetary body can maintain liquid water on its surface, um, it's different for an ice moon because an ice moon tends not to have much of an atmosphere, if any at all. And an atmosphere is required for water to stay uh, liquid. Otherwise, it will just... Um, it will just sublimate. It will just sublimate off, and it will just basically evaporate, go straight from ice to gas. So, if this happens, you end up with a moon in a new orbit around a star, and then over the over a period of time, perhaps thousands of years, perhaps millions of years, but not a huge amount of time, it will it will lose its volatiles. They'll all boil off effectively. They'll boil off that that moon. So what you end up with is is uh, basically a comet going. Uh, this moon becomes a comet going around really close to the star close enough that it sheds more and more and more material. And that material, what happens to it? Much of it will end up in orbit around the star. And probably and clump together a bit. Yes, exactly. So things will clump together as things will want to do. Some of it will be blown away by the light pressure. So think of how a solar sail works. If things are small enough, then the pressure of light on them can actually push them out. Um, so some would be blown out into the outer reaches of that system, but some would actually clump together and start clumping together. And, um, and of course, um, you're then dealing with something that, that's kind of roughly akin to you know microparticle asteroid field, if you like, where you've got tiny particles that are in a in a ring or, or a long tail, if it's if it's dragging behind, um, you know the the uh, the moon, um, going around and around, and this would actually quite easily explain the dimming events that we've seen for Tabby Star, because um, clouds of dust uh, will absorb and basically block certain frequencies of light of passing through, and because they're so spread out 
and and uh, diffuse, they can have a fairly significant effect on on how much how much you know dimming occurs for such a star. So that's what we're talking about, and it's kind of a nice case of all of these things lining up that. It may not be the whole story. It may not be the story at all, but it is. It is certainly feasible. Um, it it certainly doesn't require any special science to be taking place. It doesn't require aliens. <laughs> um, oh, they might still be there. Don't get me wrong. They could be there. But they're not totally. required. They're superfluous. They're not required. They're not required. <laughs> They'd just be observing this whole thing, basically. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where we're at. Is um, a, a nice explanation of what it could be. Um, uh, you know, a whole lot of computer simulations back it up. Of course, it does require a series of events to have occurred. But as Phil Plate, um, in his uh, story about this in the in the last few days, he he basically noted that he really likes this because it appeals to him that there was some kind of catastrophic event. And if you know anything about Phil Plate, you know he wrote a book called Death in the Skies for for one example. He loves things that are catastrophic, right? So. He loves the idea that there was some sort of catastrophic event that ripped this this uh, this moon apart, um, but he also loves the fact that all of this just fits in neatly, and and everything is explained by this. Um, but also points out it's going to take a whole lot more information, a whole lot more observation, and possibly we may never know for sure. But it is a good explanation. So if I can break it down and summarize, basically this theory is that a planet. Uh, plunged into the sun, but its moons may have, or one or more moons may have been flung off from it and is now orbiting and being sort of shredded by the star's gravity. Is that right? Uh, Not so much the gravity, although there might be some tidal forces involved as well. It is more likely based on what they're seeing and what the simulation showed them that but we're seeing the volatiles boiled off such a uh-huh. moon. So if it was an icy body and it was losing its its volatiles, which are whatever was ice on the thing, mm-hmm. it could have been it could have been oxygen, Methane. helium, yep. you know, it could have been water, who knows? But whatever it was that was on there that was ice could be now just boiling off and, and over potentially thousands of years this this would cause this um, you know, dust clouds to be mm-hmm. to be forming, and it really would match up quite well with the um, the dimming effects that we're seeing with this star. Very cool. I like it. It's as you say, it's one of those neat explanations that doesn't involve magical super events. It's just it fits what we know yeah. about physics, and again, it's computer modeling backs it up and. It may be right, it may be wrong, but it's it's a neat and elegant theory. Absolutely, and I'm a big fan of computer modelling to tell you whether your your hypotheses have any merit or not. Sure, um, they and, won't and, necessarily you know, tell you if it's true, but it's plausible no. or likely. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 if I may, because I I know I'm asking for some indulgence here because I always mention this whenever we talk about computer modeling <laughs> yes, is do. that climate modeling also <laughs> uh, doesn't tell you for sure uh, what is happening or what will happen. But when you run those models with data that you know to be true, observations from the past, and the model spits out what actually happened in the past, that's a really good sign that the mm-hmm. model is sound. Absolutely. And therefore, it's a good sign that the model can, can at least give you some insights into what will happen. Uh, and I'll jump off my soapbox now. <laughs> All right. Well, Penny, let's uh, bring the reins back off Lucas before he goes further down a rabbit hole of ranting. Because <laughs> our next... A rabbit hole of ranting. Yeah. I like it. It's good. It's just a show title right there. <laughs> but our next story starts way back in 1971 when University of Chicago psychologist Martha McClintock asked 135 women living in college dorms to record the dates when their periods began at three times throughout the academic year. She found that close friend groups had periods significantly closer together in April, which was later in the year, compared with October. Their periods went from an average of 6.4 days apart to 4.6, and this became known initially as the McClintock effect, And then more formally, menstrual synchrony, the idea that girls who live together sync together. And it's still a widely held belief nearly 50 years later. 
but there's just one problem, isn't there, Penny? It's not true. It's not true. It's not <laughs> only one small problem. And as I myself found out a number of hours ago, it is not true. So there you go. Like, and I'm a biology teacher. I have come across. I was this weirdly myth. wondering I was, where you were going with no, that anecdote. I was then. <laughs> no. Well, I swear that I have read it in maybe not in textbooks, but you know, it's presented as. Oh, you know, women who live too closely together, their periods can synchronise, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sure, and this was apparently quite um, debunked in about 1999 or so. So, you know, that's 20 years ago. Mm. Um, And really, it's sort of clear how it could come about in that, you know, on average, a woman's cycle is about 28 days typically, quote unquote. So you can only be 14 days kind of maximum out of phase. So on average, you'd think people be about seven days apart in terms of when their period starts. But a period can last five days a week. So if you're talking to your close friend, which is probably the only people you really are going to talk about your periods. You're like, like, oh, hi, Ed. Hi, Lucas. Just thought you guys should know, like, I'm a few days late this cycle. You know, like, we don't, we don't chat that way. No. 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 Um, but, um, you know, there's a one in four chance that, yeah, your period is probably happening at the same time. Is it, so it's sort what, of like yeah. how... I often say, you know, people talk about, oh, is the full moon, does that have an effect on our behaviour and stuff? And I say, well, yeah, 100% of murders happen yeah. within two weeks of a full moon. Mm. And it takes them a while to figure it out that that's because it's a month. And it's interesting you mention moons because this idea that mm. women's periods will synchronise not just with each other but also with the moon and, <laughs> you know, maybe it's just our technology lifestyle and going on the pill that stops this beautiful, mystical female blah, oh, blah, blah, please. blah, blah. <laughs> anyway, but we're not actually talking about this not being true because that came out in 1999 and we do on Science on Top try and keep to somewhat current research. Yeah, it's um, a goal. It's a goal. What is interesting is, and this is what the most recent study has been looking at, is, well, why is this so persistent? Because I'd read it before, um, hormones, pheromones, subconscious, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, yeah, sounds fair enough. You know? Yeah. Haven't personally experienced it, but, hey, I haven't lived with large groups of women who I've discussed my period with, so what would I know? You know, the last time... I was doing that was in at school. I'm pretty, you know, we would have died mm. <laughs> rather than talk about these things. So this is really interesting. Obviously, there's an element of confirmation bias in that people might tend to believe it, they hear it, and they think, oh, yeah, when I spoke to my mum or my sister or my best friend and asked them for a tampon because they're the only people I'm going to ask for, you know, they had their period too. So that kind of, we tend to go, oh, yeah, we don't notice the times when something doesn't confirm our belief. We notice the ones that do. But there's other reasons too because a lot of people do think it's real. I mean, I thought it was real. I I never really invested much in that thought, but, yeah. And it might be that women believe this and I'm just going to say women because the article studied women's thoughts about this not men's thoughts about this in particular and women with periods um, in that it seems like a way of connecting with other women or something that is really primal or animalistic or really basic that um, women experience together. Um, Some women felt that it sort of reflected hierarchies in a group so that everyone will sync with the alpha female kind of thing. Um, It also allows women to connect. There's a lot of aspects of periods, like this idea of, you know, feeling grumpy before your period or feeling hungry or wanting chocolate and as well as being... I think I've always got my period. (laughs) (laughs) I'm always grumpy and I'm always hungry and I always want chocolate, so... There you go. But um, it can, you know, so this idea that periods can sink 
can also lead to feelings of solidarity like we're in this together we're suffering together because I don't I don't know anyone who really loves having their period they often are painful and messy and awkward and all the rest and that could be an empowering feeling because you know it has been shown that you know women aren't meant to be angry especially as a group you know we are sometimes not believed about our pain or you know this idea about um you know women's pain can sometimes be downplayed or trivialized or so on and whereas we know that hormones do affect our mood they do affect our bodies but it is interesting how this particular what this particular myth of or not myth because i guess even though subsequent studies have failed to find it like it's really this idea that has persisted long past its some um, usefulness mm-hmm. yeah so why is it um important why to so many women and this article was published in women's Re- a journal of um women's reproductive health and it was presented at a conference about menstrual research and advocacy and a lot of people were really apparently quite aggressive to the idea that period thinking didn't have scientific support so i think it's really interesting because i mean we've talked before about how science it can be biased i mean a lot of medical tests are done on you know white male college students or you know university students it's not necessarily appreciating the diversity of humanity in terms of what's studied and like i don't know if i'm being biased going oh well you know the published papers say no this is not a thing but then why is it so important to believe so i just found this really interesting a because it it was not something i'd thought about very often but i certainly had accepted it i'm like oh yeah there's a study it happens okay and um but to think about you know why partic- why seemingly non-scientific ideas can take hold and get traction and this one's a reasonably harmless one mm. but yeah it does happen in the context of a lot of pseudoscience i think when you get ideas like this that just keep coming up all the time i think a lot of it is just how it's represented in television and movies and books mm. and things like that where it's it's a really useful uh, plot device, I guess. Yeah. A lot of yeah. storylines was, and a punchline often in your comedies mm. and that. And just when you get repetition so often, it becomes ingrained in people that that's just what happens, even though yeah, the science isn't there. Yeah. Why would all these people keep saying it if it wasn't yeah. if it wasn't true? Yeah. But now we all know. There is no actual evidence and you've heard it on Science on Top so you can (laughs) tell your friends when they next say, oh, she's also on her period. We must have seen. Oh, we're so in sync. We have a mystical connection. I heard it on Science on Top. That's a myth. And we're not necessarily saying it's not true and it doesn't happen. What we are saying is that of all the attempts to reproduce and the statistical analysis has not found any significant evidence of that link. Oh, and I mean, also, I mean, obviously people's periods can be sure. happening at the same time. Like, yep. that's, yeah, like, as I said, like, statistically, that's quite likely. But it's whether they change depending, yeah. Yep. Now, Lucas, a few weeks ago, we talked about a new flu vaccine developed with the help of artificial intelligence. And now a study recently published in the journal Nature suggests that an AI has managed to predict future scientific discoveries by analysing existing research. What is natural language programming? Uh, when I saw, <laughs> when I, it's like when I saw, it, it's it's uh, acronym is NLP. Yep. When I saw that in sceptical oh. circles, NLP is neuro linguistic programming. Yeah, isn't yep. that that Which, weird pickup artist stuff? Essentially, yeah, yes. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. okay, good. good. <laughs> I have written, it's funny you say that, Ed, because I've written in big red letters, not neuro-linguistic <laughs> programming, exclamation mark. Uh, I love it. We all had the same thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, NLP, neuro-linguistic programming, is not something that science looks upon as a thing. So, um, so you can educate yourselves about that. However, natural language processing, which is also using the NLP um, acronym, is apparently one of the big 
targets for AI. And this effectively is is for AI to build a full understanding of human language and 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 derive and, and extract meaning from it. The the goal here is to have AI uh, at a point that it can effectively read things for you and tell you what's important. Um, oh, I wish. And, <laughs> oh, I know. I know. But it's it's about more than just, okay, here's an index of things. Here are all the papers that contain this word or all the papers that deal with this subject. It is about um, AI learning for itself how to identify quality research, how to identify the hallmarks of a paper which actually is um, – mind-blowing or, you know, um, impactful in its area of study for various reasons. That is a pretty deep thing because it's not just looking for keywords and relationships. It's looking for things that we as humans would would probably regard as very um, – it's very much a human trait to, to be able to make those almost value judgments about things as to whether whether they're um, you know they're, they're worthy and whether they show promise. I'm not going to go into this in great detail because it is a little bit uh, thick, but basically it comes down to a, um, a a team have have built an AI which has managed to teach itself by trawling through over one and a half million science papers, um, dealing, I believe, in because the article doesn't, doesn't touch on this specifically, but I believe they were dealing with a particular type of research. Uh, and it relates to, um, it relates to photovoltaic cells and gas and heat exchange and, and ways of, of harvesting energy and so forth. So, um, so there's the, the they taught, they gave, they basically fed this AI, uh, you know, over a million and a half papers that seems primarily to deal with various chemical science um, uh, projects and, and and research on things like photovoltaic cells and other um, other materials and material sciences that deal with with harvesting energy and so forth. That was my my read from it, but uh, it might have just been what this particular author zoned in on in in what they had um, given the the AI. And the, the, what's really interesting is the way that the AI learned. There's two main ways of of teaching an AI. One of them is to Feed it information and then give it um, give it input. So you say to it, okay. So the the correct um, outcome from this is that, or you you should derive this uh, conclusion from reading that, or this paper is should be classified in this way because it deals in these things. So it's that's a guided AI. You basically you teach it by feeding it information and then telling it what to think about that information. All right, so mm-hmm. that's one way of doing it. This AI is a different approach, though, where it learns for itself, and we've we've talked about this a few times recently. So, if an AI is learning for itself, you're not giving it any kind of um, feedback at all. You're just saying, "You figure it out. Here's all the papers. You figure out what's good." Now, if you remember a while ago, the Goo, I think it was the was it the Microsoft Deep Learning, or was it the Google one? I can't remember. One of them basically turned into a Nazi almost overnight. Do you remember this? <laughs> yeah, from, I remember from that. The, I think, yeah. Uh, I think it might have been Microsoft. Was, I can't remember exactly. Yeah, I, I can't remember which one it was, but basically it was, it was let loose on social media, which I don't know, if you're going to – if you're going to learn how to be a human, I'm not sure. I mean, on one hand, it's probably the Actually, best possible yeah. place to learn, <laughs> <laughs> but in the other yeah. hand, it's not. It's certainly not the not the examples that you you probably would want to set no, for an was, AI that's going to make decisions about your life in some way. It was Microsoft, and they fed it basically Twitter, and right. Surprise, surprise! It turned into Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> So, and and a really like a very believable participant on Twitter as well. It was mm. it, it was full on, re- like within a very short time, it went from being very polite and nice natured to just horrible, like worthy of Congress, horrible. And and wow. um, yeah, well, you, you don't disagree though, do you? No. So. 
so so uh, that that style of AI is basically just learning for itself because it takes the feedbacks of of the of of the interactions with other people to say, am I am I dialed in right? This is how we learn as humans, largely, right? This is you know often how children learn through trial and error, and they put they do things that don't work, and you know as they slowly develop their spatial awareness and their language skills and so forth, they try things that don't work, and they 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 just sort of stumble over what works and they repeat it. So this is similar. In, in many ways to what's happening here with AI. But what they did, rather than steer it, rather than tell it what the answers are, and what, rather than telling it what it should have derived from what it had read, is they basically came up with a way of it, uh, it, it had a sort of a self-checking mechanism in it where it could say, okay, I think this is what the outcome is. Now let me apply it against this set of rules and, and does it fit in and so on and so forth. So... What does it mean? What it means is potentially, very, very quickly, we may well reach a point where we are no longer even mentioning AI on the on the podcast because it could become so such a, a huge tool in research and in really in ridiculous. um yeah and and I and I think it's going to reach that point much much faster than. Then I certainly realised, uh, you know, until recently, that this is just everywhere now. It's mm. everywhere. The thing that gets me about this is essentially this is doing pattern recognition, which for decades has been the domain of humans. Computers couldn't do pattern recognition very well. That was an innately human thing that we were able to do, spot patterns. And if this is getting so good that now an AI is as good or better at humans at pattern recognition, that's a massive shift. Uh, that is going to completely revolutionise how computing is done and how we live our lives. It's extraordinary. And the applications, we're only barely sniffing the surface of it. There's going to be so many other things that we haven't even thought of once you get that pattern recognition ability, that learning ability perfected by ai we are redundant <laughs> we are no we longer are. needed we just don't know it we just we just <laughs> haven't fully registered this this is why we need to completely change our, our oh. yeah we, we've got to change the way our economies work because this is you know jobs will go to this stuff we we can't keep doing what we're doing anyway another another rabbit hole I won't <laughs> rabbit hole of ranting <laughs> the, <laughs> the science on top story that's our documentary the making of <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's our show. As always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 342. Thanks to all our Patreon supporters. We've been doing this show for more than eight years. That sort of staying power is really only possible because of everyone who's chipped in at scienceontop.com slash donate. So thank you very much. And thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. We're thrilled to be speaking live with two brave American astronauts who are making history, joining us during their spacewalk outside the International Space Station. And this is the first time for a woman outside of the space station, our flight engineers, Christina Cook and flight engineer, Jessica Meir. You are amazing people. They're conducting the first ever female spacewalk to replace an exterior part of the space station. Uh, they're doing some work and uh, they're doing it in a very high altitude, an altitude that very few people will ever see. We don't want to take too much credit because there have been many other female spacewalkers before us. This is just the first time that there have been two women outside at the same time. And it's really interesting for us. We've talked a lot about it up here. You know, for us, this is really just us doing our job. It's something we've been training for for six years and preparing for. And so it didn't really, you know, for us, it's just coming out here and doing our job today. We were the, we were the crew that was tasked with this assignment. At the same time, we recognize that it is a historic achievement, and we do, of course, want to give credit to all those that came before us. 
There's been a long line of female scientists, explorers, engineers, and astronauts, and we have followed in their footsteps to get us where we are today.